Osiris. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight shines on author and educator Michael Quelker, who's here to talk about his recent book, The Ozark Mountain Daredevils on Record, a narrative discography. The Ozark Mountain Daredevils are an American rock group first formed in 1972. Hailing from Springfield, Missouri, the band had two major hits, If You Want to Get to Heaven, from their debut album in 1974, and a certified smash, Jackie Blue, from their 1975 follow-up. Michael's book uses the framework of their official and unofficial discography as the scaffolding on which to hang not only 50 years of their story, but to go back further to describe the music and the cultural scenes of the Ozark region, as well as the various threads of the music business and cultural industries that the band buffeted against over the years. It's a unique mode of storytelling about a very, very unique group of musicians, one worth reading and applying to other artists and scenes. Michael joined us to talk about his work on the book and to give us a bunch of insight into the band and the world they developed in. Enjoy. If you had said to me, or if one had said to me, I have a 514-page book on the Ozark Mountain Daredevils, I would have said, why in the world do I need a 514-page book on the Ozark Mountain Daredevils? Now I wish every band and every local and regional music scene of any note had something like this book. It's really incredible, the context and sort of all the pieces that you were able to synthesize. I remember you talking about this project. I can't quite place it in time. COVID kind of screwed up my my sense of time. But my memory is that you've been working on this for a minute. Can you can you talk a little bit about when you had the realization you had a project here? Yeah, it started very slowly and it started actually almost a decade ago when I was in the run up to my 50th birthday. And that zero birthday affected me in a profound way. And I thought of it as if, what do I want to carry from the first 50 years across this divide? And I had kind of fallen out of touch with their music and with the guys, except for the bass player, Soup Granda, whom I've known for 35 years. And I thought, okay, the Daredevils mean a lot to me, and I haven't checked them out in a long time. So I just thought of their music, and I just started writing a list, all the albums in their order. And then I wondered how many singles they put out. I was aware of the ones in the 1970s under A&M, but what else? And then this list morphed into the idea of a book. It was a, a year or so after that, that I started making inquiries about interview requests and so forth. I knew that Soup Granda would speak to me. So I, I thought at the very least, I'll get Soup Granda of the Ozark Mountain Terror Devils takes us through a tour of the discography and I'd have something there. And then I just started asking and receiving interview requests. And it was something that built from there. And then I thought, okay, now I've got something. If I've got Granda and the other two original members who were in the band at the time, Steve Cash and John Dillon, Steve Cash has sadly died since then. He died in 2019. But at the time, three of the original members were leading the band. And I thought, okay, if I have them on board, then I can go beyond that, go to the original members who were not in the band, and then to other songwriters who were responsible for songs that appeared on their albums. And I thought if I if I adhere to the discography, to the official and then to the unofficial recordings, what kind of story emerges? And that really interested me because it relieved me of the responsibility of trying to come up with a band biography, which just seemed unwieldy for me to do at any rate. But I thought this storytelling about the music is where it's at. And that's how I'm going to organize the book. That actually foreshadows or addresses the other sort of initial large question I had, which was why the discography format when ultimately, I think, ironically, given your answer, it winds up serving as a pretty good biography of their life and times and their career. So there was never the notion to start biographically it was always this was going to be a discography and the project grew from there is that safe yeah that is exactly what happened 
because they deserve this much. Now, if they were Bob Dylan or any number of other more famous artists about whom there are many, many books, then maybe if there were that gap in the music literature that's been published on them, then maybe I would have had that idea. But I thought at the very least, they deserve attention to the music. Where did this come from? I think that the two biggest hits that the Daredevils had, If You Want to Get to Heaven and Jackie Blue, kind of had an over-determining effect on casual listeners. And you either dug it, you know, the the foot stomp and country rock, and If You Want to Get to Heaven, or you dug the soft rock of Jackie Blue. In documenting this music, I realized that if you did a word cloud of the songs of theirs that appeared on various artists compilation it would be jackie blue it would be if you want to get to heaven and then the in the tiniest print would be song number three so there's a skew that way and so people know them primarily of for these reasons unless you're hardcore in the in the fold with the band and so i wanted to pay tribute to the music and do it in a way while they're still around to get them on on the record as it were to talk about this because they haven't been as extensively interviewed as they probably should have. A couple of the words that you're using deserve, should have, what, what's the esteem you hold them in? Great question. I think their songwriting has some aspects to it that I try to develop in the book with some commentaries on lyrics after their albums in the, in the 1970s. There's more going on there than I believe has been documented in the annals of music literature. So that's why I have my little commentary after the debut album, Ozark Mountain Transcendentalism. And there is kind of a motif to some of the songwriting from Steve Cash and John Dylan and Randall Chowning and Larry Lee when they were in the band. And to some extent, Soup Granda, who's not as prolific within the Daredevils, that they'll take some aspect of nature that's physical and that's manifest and combine it with some idea or ethereal image, something immaterial. And it's the combination of the two that I see in their songwriting that I don't believe has been remarked upon in the music literature. Has there been other looks at them and and that sort of unique aspect of them? I mean, you mentioned a, a strong theme throughout the book is this notion of, for better and worse, that there were so many songwriting voices which was, I think, a strength of the band and contributed to the remarks you just made, but also maybe was one of the things that kept them from having an identifiable sound or a consistent sound. And the, and you, you remark a lot about sort of, I hope I'm getting this right, but like a restlessness of the songwriters, like songwriters are going to write or their songwriters are going to evolve. And that may not necessarily serve them well in a commercial sense when you have a record label that's trying to just get your music on radio or something like that. And I wonder, was that notion introduced to you by another source, or was that was that is that your original sort of thesis here? Randall Chowning, in one of the interviews that's in the book, discusses this that that there's all this stimulation that happens when guys are throwing songs out, but then you got to package it and market it, and then when your biggest hits come out to be number one and number two the first one is if you want to get to heaven then the soft rock it's it's hard to get a grip in the public imagination when that happens and it also because of the success of jackie it led the record company to want more of the soft rock larry lee so that skewed things a little bit whereas hardcore daredevil fans love the eclecticism and the variety can you talk a little bit about that about the fan community and sort of who and what you discovered in that regard along this journey are you the most hardcore daredevil person or is there like a guy or gal who's like the resource and the keeper of the ephemera and who became a good so i'm just you know i love fandoms and i'm so interested in that world what's their universe look like that's a great question because there are some really hardcore people and i thank them in particular because they supplied me with music. There's just this spirit of giving that when people found out that I was doing this book and I was documenting unreleased recordings, there's a man named Fred Rydell, who has been a longtime friend back to the 70s with Randall Chowning. 
and through his association with Randall at that time, came into contact with demos aplenty. Tom and Ginny Wynn Schroeder are uh, longtime fans and collectors and supplied me with some live recordings that I didn't even know existed. They're the folks, uh, Tom and, and Ginny Wynn, have a daredevil room in their home with all kinds of memorabilia on the walls. And they're definitely super fans like that who have that level of fandom. And I go through about a dozen of them in my Wildwood Springs Lodge essay chapter later in the book, because that is a part of this too. It's titled A Narrative Discography. And having set up some of the terms for that engagement, then I want to give you as much as I can. I want to give you even a look at some of the super fans for a a couple, three pages in that essay. Is the narrative discography as a form something else you came across? Was there a model? Was there a, was there something you read that you said, Oh, this, this vehicle would serve me well for this story? Because it, it, it's so effective. The way the, the way you use the catalog just as a framing device for all of their stories. And even, even some of the digressions you go into to set the, sort of cultural or business context, which I I want to come back to as well. Are there other narrative discographies that you would point to as shining examples? I believe this is the only one titled or subtitled this way. And I I would like to do this again. I would never be able to do a, a narrative discography like this book on any other band because I've really grown up with the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. The time that I got hipped to them, my other favorite band was Black Sabbath. And I still love Black Sabbath. I think we all do. But I wouldn't be able to do a narrative discography like this book, even if I were granted the interviews that I would want for that book. I think we could agree that everybody on this call loves Black Sabbath. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for good reason. Yeah, we'll have that conversation another time. So I do obviously want to get to, to talking about the band specifically but I'm so sort of fascinated with the making of this book and how you came to think about it and formulate it and put it together that I want to spend a little more time in this this end of the pool if we can. I want to talk a little bit about what I hopefully am not disparagingly referring to as the digressions and the the context setters that you have throughout the book. There were two or three that really stood out for me. The first one, which was a little bit recurring, was the role of radio. Just as a sort of nod to people that may or may not have listened to this podcast over the last few years, you know, I talk a lot about the importance of radio growing up and that there's a lot of things that can be said, right? People sort of roughly of our age, what the radio meant in terms of being a portal to the outside world and the music discovery and just the diversity of sounds that radio hit me to. It could be everything from at one end, Dr. Demento. (laughs) <laughs> and to the other end, college radio and all points in between, you know. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you learned or what you have to say on the topic of like the role of radio for this band, that scene and your own life. I grew up on FM radio, rock radio in the 70s. And that was stations like 94.7, KC95, as we called it, KADI were the two biggest ones in my universe in the mid to late 70s. And Kay She, from the beginning, didn't just play what the radio stations were told to play. That kind of dynamic happened later. So the radio jocks were playing different things from their albums, album tracks, as we called it. So I wasn't limited to what I heard from the Daredevils or anybody else. And that was really good. I'm glad of that. Now, I have some critique of radio about how white it was, and it had diversity within a certain kind of limitation as I look back on it now. But at the time, it was just exciting to be exposed to all this music. And radio station Casey had a relationship that still exists in some regard to this day with the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. And they played Chicken Train at I think 7.45 a.m. every Friday. So just as I was pulling into the high school parking lot, I'm hearing chicken train. So that was a little bit of the rural absurd to get me going to go to high school at uh, DeSmet Jesuit High School. FM radio in the 1970s was perfect for a band like the Ozark Mountain Daredevils because 
it was eclectic and it wasn't as corporation driven as it became just a few years later. And so they developed relationships with FM radio staff. And I was glad to include interviews with two people who were still in radio as older guys who were around in the 70s and 1980s, Randy Rayleigh and John Hewlett. So I was glad to get their insight as radio people. And Randy Rayleigh kind of has a little diversion about the KC Ozark Mountain Daredevil charity softball games that they staged once a year for three or four years. Randy gets distracted as he's a pitcher and takes a uh, a softball right in the mouth and he loses teeth. And there's some follow up with Soup Granda that's very funny about that. And I was just glad to include that because in a discography, what's that doing there? But it works. This personal relationship that was established between artists and radio DJs then had an effect for audience members like me. And there was something about the culture. I didn't attend one of those charity softball games at the time. I wish I did. I knew they were happening, but it's just not something I did. But that was just another way to kind of seal the bond tighter between artists and radio. Yeah, it was really interesting to get the sense of, and I think some of the people in the book even used the word, but there was an accessibility, whether it was to that band or just bands of that era, like the idea that the local heroes were playing this charity softball game every year. There's something incredibly powerful in that. And and to your point, sort of bond forming, not only with the with the jocks, but with the fan base, like the, the type of thing that allows you 50 years later to still put on shows because people remember that they had those experiences with you as a, as a band member. It, it's such a neat artifact of a different time. Something else you talked about, again, I, I sort of knew this, but to have the opportunity to reflect on it was the role, especially around the turn of the sixties to the early seventies of like the local and regional festival scene, how sort of spawned by, I guess the hippie movement and coming after Woodstock it seemed like everywhere had a festival and it didn't all have to be six figures number of people, although many of them were, but these three, five, 15,000 people festivals put on by local people with access to a little bit of scratch and able to find the agents to get the town. You know, it's amazingly like the hustle and the sort of sense of adventure and fun behind that, but really created this opportunity for bands like the Ozarks to get in front of a lot of people all at once. I wonder if you, maybe you could talk about this sort of festival movement. There was an infamous festival in 1970 called the Finley River Music Festival. And several of the future Ozark Mountain Daredevils were in bands that played at that, just as you described, a smaller, but still for the occasion and for the region, a massive undertaking. I think in the neighborhood, probably at five or 6,000 attendees. And so that was hugely catalytic for the hippies because there was a lot of excessive behavior and it was covered in the run up to the event. And then for weeks afterward, it was infamous. Now there was a, a much larger Ozark music festival that took place in 1974 and the Ozark Mountain Daredevils were booked, but they did not perform. And one of the things that I think still confuses people to this day is that they were listed on the bill for this even grander and, and more excessive festival. But the smaller one, the Finley River Music Festival in 1970, they were a part of. And it was just like you described, independent guys with a notion. They had been to some larger festivals on the coasts and thought, let's have that right here with our bands and you know, a few name acts. In that case, the James Gang, probably the biggest artist of that Finley River Music Festival. And the fallout from that was just awesome. I was so happy to be able to include a headline <laughs> in the one of the Springfield newspapers, uh, Sexable in a Sinless City oh. was the headline. And I thought <laughs> that is headline gold. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to shoehorn that into my text because I want my book to have that line. Sexable in a sinless city, which yeah. is how they viewed, some people viewed the situation. It is a, a, a highly Christian, truly 
conservative and politically conservative area then and now. So the presence of a, a nascent hippie movement that was bringing people together where they were partaking of drugs, it was quite the uh, explosive thing. Yeah. Something I couldn't reconcile in reading the book was, you know, you allude several times to that, that sort of cultural conservatism and even to the extent of some of the clamp down by the police and how they treated people coming and going from festivals or leaving shows, but the scene flourished and it doesn't seem like it was totally locked down. And if I equate that at all to things I remember growing up, it's a slightly later era, but still with the hangover effect of a lot of that, the attitude seemed to be like, if you keep it out of our face, just go over there and do it, but don't go do it over here. And we've got no problems. It's as soon as like it becomes something the authorities have to confront and deal with, as opposed to them having to go look for it, which it really seemed like they had no interest in. It was just, don't, don't, don't bring it to polite society. And I wonder is that all correct? Was it much more aggressive and proactive or was there a, like a tacit agreement between the heads and the authorities? How was it able to flourish? How how was the St. Louis area and the Ozarks more generally able to have this scene? It's a good question. And I think of a figure whom I describe in the book in that Finley River section, Sheriff Buff Lamb. Yeah. Now, he was somebody who was going after the hippies couple of the daredevils, well, I, Larry Lee lived at some place called The Ranch, and it was a little constellation of a few houses, and it was a practice space for the band Granny's Bathwater, and it was a place where people smoked their weed, etc. And so there were raids on The Ranch. Sheriff Buff Lamb, among others, were going after hippies, and yet they maintained their counterculture. And places like the New Bijou Theater were a haven. That was the short-lived counterculture-friendly venue where the Daredevils first convened and first rehearsed and performed. Only a open six months, but it was an important little moment in that scene. Brought people together and brought that kind of bonding and gave people like the Daredevils performing opportunities. And it gave the community the chance to see artists like Can't Heat, Harvey Mandel, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee for the blues element, which was certainly popular. And in, in that whole terrain of if you liked country rock, you probably weren't just listening to country rock, but you were interested in heritage music and roots music of varying kinds. Yeah, they were able to to persist despite the overlay of so much cultural conservatism. We'll be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media, after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Something that, that stood out for me, especially as it relates to that era, but it's, it's been sort of fix, it's been a fixation of mine since finishing the book, is that I go back to something I said earlier, which is I would love to see something like this for so many of those regional scenes around the country. We know they existed. Some of them spawned bands and and are scenes that we all talk about in the annals of rock history. But I would suspect there are so many more that are just memories for people that aren't as well documented, but that had vibrant local bands, local venues, local festivals, and all kinds of mayhem that would be just a treasure to know about and probably very inspirational to know about. And I wonder if as you were researching this book, did you discover any pockets like that that you either were able to rabbit hole into or that you said, oh, I would I want to go back and learn more about that story, that scene, that person? Like what didn't make the book that you discovered that was super fascinating? Two micro labels that were established by the music mogul, the local one, Cy Simon, who was responsible for Ozark Jubilee. He was doing some things in the mid and late 1960s. The Skipper label and the Scratch label were two that were putting out some country, some rockabilly, and some northern soul, and not an extensive discography in either case, but there was this thing happening, and I wanted to do more about the Ozark music scene of the 60s. There was something that just emotionally draws me to that era. It hasn't been as extensively documented even still, 
to this day. And I'd like to do more with that. In fact, if I ever revisit this material, I'd like to maybe pull out what I've got about the five years leading up to the formation of the Ozark Mountain Daredevils and then bring in this other material and just say, here's this kind of making of period. And I don't know what I'd call it or how I would really get my arms around it. But that that period, because it's not corporation dominated, right. it's people with their ideas and their little bit of funding making things happen. Cy Simon, I'd like to do more with. I've got his son quoted discussing the importance of Ozark Jubilee, among other things. But that's interesting. There's there's more there than I was able to to bring in. It feels important and subversive to document those things, especially as things become or, or already are more corporate and homogenized. Like to have this documentation that there is another way and that there was a va- a very vibrant other way. It doesn't feel like a luxury to me. It feels important and it's somewhat essential. I hope you get to do that work to to start to make our way towards the music a little more now. What was the role or what was the significance of Granny's Bathwater, a local musical group? What was the significance of that band in the scene and in the in the development of the Ozarks? Michael Bungie was the band leader and he was this charismatic guy who played multiple instruments and just oozed cool. And so he was this catalytic figure. And it was the expectation of the kind of music heads of the time that Granny's Bathwater is going to be the band that gets signed and and gets out of here if there's any band locally that will do that. So the expectations were behind Granny's. And they started as this kind of blues rock small ensemble in the late 1960s and then about 1970 and 71 they shift to this horn driven sound that was a little later popularized by chicago and blood sweat and tears among others and they were doing original music and influencing people to up their game as musicians number one locally and number two just kind of look to some possibilities that there was this air of expectation as i say that they would launch out of the local scene and they had residencies out of town in in Florida and New Orleans and they did hit the road. They backed Martha Reeves for a couple of tours, appeared on ABC TV in 1972 backing Martha Reeves. And so there was this watchful waiting among music people for their star to rise. And although it didn't happen like that, just a few years later, Michael Bungie died in an auto accident they left an imprint on people of their generation, the fellow musicians and and the audience. And unfortunately, they didn't record as much as uh, we would like to see in retrospect. But uh, I was able to speak to Michael Bungie's brother, Ed, who was a musician for many years, owned a drum shop, and he gave me just a priceless anecdote about the kind of coming to musical awareness of his brother, Michael, way back in the day. So it's just one of these seeds that nobody knew at the time would then flower. Granny's Bathwater had several daredevils at different times in that band. So it was kind of like school for uh, several of the guys. Something that strikes me, and I, I want to I wanna frame it respectfully because... Michael Bungie was obviously a real person with real family and uh, made a real impact on other people. But there's a mythological aspect to that story. And it almost seems like it's like, of course, that happened. Of course, there is this predecessor band with this mythical figure who's no longer with us, who sort of inspired and catalyzed this scene around him. It almost reads like fiction. You're right. There's so much about that that's seems larger than life. And I think that fictional magical quality carries through to how these guys got together, even though they may look kind of similar, especially when they got together, they're skinny, hairy, white hippies, but they have differing influences. John Dillon with his Stuttgart, Arkansas background, his interest in folk and blues and country blues. And you've got Steve Cash, who is not really a musician at all, but became self-taught on the harmonica and became really good at it. But nobody knew that right at first. And he was a poet. 
He had never been in a band before the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Then he gets signed to Ann Am and he's recording with Glyn Johns in London, England. That is magical. Uh, Larry Lee with his influences, Randall Chowning growing up in Mountain View, Missouri. And because his father is a tech head, is able to tune into radio stations from Memphis and being exposed to that kind of music in the 1950s in southern mid-Missouri. So there's some really magical elements to the story. That kept striking me again and again throughout the throughout the narrative. And I'm sure a significant piece of that is embedded in the people and the stories themselves, but also the way you pieced it together and you told it didn't necessarily dramatically or artificially magnify those elements, but just sort of surfaced them, you know, made them apparent, buffed them a little bit. So Glenn Johns, it's sort of hard to talk about this band without talking about Glenn Johns. Am I correct in the the material from Glenn in your book is pulled from his book? You, you weren't able to speak with him directly? That's right. I did ask for, but did not receive an interview. I should have tried a little harder because he just appeared in the Ozark Mountain Daredevils documentary that came out last summer from Ozark's public television. And he zoomed in from his home in England and was just delightful with his memories and his regard for the band. So I should have tried harder. I should have tried to get that interview with with Mr. Johns. Can you talk just briefly about what did he do for the band? What did he bring to the band? Just so our listeners are, I'm sure most know, but Glenn Johns was initially a very famous recording engineer, then ultimately a producer who really brought the best out of a lot of the mid late sixties, British bands, stones and others ultimately worked with the Eagles and the Ozarks and countless other bands. But he's, he's, he's sort of in the pantheon of the knob twiddlers in the music space of that era. Glenn had a, he had a knack for bringing out the best in artists and getting a sound. I don't know if it's necessarily his sound or their sound, but a sound. And he seemed to work particularly well with American bands of sort of a roots variety, right? Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. And by the time the Daredevils began working with him, he had worked with some of the industry's leading artists, the Stones, the Beatles, the Who. He was fresh from producing the Eagles. And what I didn't know until I researched more about him, and then his book came out, that helped, is that he's an old folky at heart. He loves old time folk music and then he got into the industry and worked with these other artists that's why we come to know him at least at first for most of us but then he was on the look out for a roots artist and when david anderley found out about the ozark mountain daredevils when they were shopping for a deal mr anderley called glenn johns and said i think you know i've got the artist that you want to work with come check them out so that's how that happen because you got to wonder what are these guys doing working with the Glenn Johns in 1973 on their first two albums what he brought was that element of culling their best work and he brought a cohesion that I'm not able to identify that brings together the 10 songs on the debut album and the 12 songs on the follow-up it'll shine when it shines somehow he was able to make that sound cohesive in a way that they didn't when he wasn't working with them. As much as I like the next albums, by the time we get to Don't Look Down, it almost sounds like a good various artists compilation album with four different lead singers, five or six guys throwing in the songs. The cohesion effect wasn't there as good as I might like the songs, whereas the albums as an entity, a full set, that works in both cases. How he was able to do that, I still don't know. I mean, I've been told, I think we all get an education on his miking techniques. And yeah, that's part of it. Right. But there's some kind of a special sauce that he brings that I'm not able to identify. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because if it was simply those technical elements, they'd be learnable and duplicatable more, much more readily. It's funny to hear you say that about the various artists album and how other producers weren't able to kind of harness the same cohesion. It made me think about another band you talk about, which was Kiss, right? And like four guys 
four different voices, clearly four different sets of musical influences, four different sounds in their songs on an album. And I think that as a music fan of a certain type, you come to like that, right? Like you hear a band and you're like, wow, all this, you, every, you can have your favorite band member or your favorite style. Like it gives you more to attach a fandom onto. It's just more fodder for debate and, and passion and focus and, and things of that nature. But it also presents a lot of challenges creatively to talk about where we were earlier. And it's interesting that it takes that outside force, that outside presence to probably to a certain extent mediate all that, focus it, refine it. And then once that presence is gone, the differences are much more highlighted. It's a really fascinating aspect of their story. And interesting in that as you get later in the book, and obviously I didn't I didn't want to spend our time together sort of dissecting the book because we're going to dramatically encourage people to read it and and explore it for themselves. But something that struck me as I got to maybe the back third of the book, and certainly once you got through the 80s, which were, I think you've said it pretty clearly, difficult time for the band, really just like barnstorming it through difficult gigs, small gigs, you know, the way they started to look back and talk about what they did do, the choices they made, what they could have done differently, the decision not to be road dogs during their initial success and to sort of balance the, their life and their work, not to move to Los Angeles, not to compromise on the songwriting. I mean, there's a there's a certain integrity into their choices that clearly had tangible repercussions on their financial outcomes, their maybe their legacy. Yeah, I mean, you have to admire like the steadfastness of those choices. It's incredible. It really is. And I know that there's some some looking back on that choice not to move to the West Coast. At the time, the guys had spent, the songwriters at least, had spent some of that publishing money on large tracts of land. And they were wedded to that. At that in particular, had an effect on their career, particularly was when it wasn't matched with the duplication of the success of a Jackie Blue. But they are who they are, and that's why real fans love them. Would they have written their bucolic songs out on the West Coast? Maybe, but we don't know. It would have made it easier for them to hop on to the Mike Douglas show if that kind of an opportunity had come up, and that would have furthered their careers but they are some stubborn guys for better or for worse i mean they got glenn johns to come to them to record an album yeah that's something that i didn't quite understand why did you if this worked so well in london why did you do it here and then because that worked so well in bolivar missouri to take the mobile recording truck out to rudy valley ranch that produced such a great set of songs why didn't you do that well they were they're artists. They want to, oh, let's go to Nashville. Let's go to Caribou. They had that kind of searching quality. I would have been more along the lines of, it'll shine when it shine, just produced awesome songs. Let's do it again. But that's not how they thought. Yeah, it's really incredible. A part of the book that I, I don't, it's a, it, it like, it tickled me so deeply and it came up a couple of times in the discography was the role or the presence of the compilation. You did a little bit of a deep dive into k -Tel. And I wonder if you could talk for our listeners. I mean, those are the original playlists, right? Like to sort of give a modern analogy. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about either k -Tel specifically or that, that genre more generally, but the role in that, what did it mean for artists in terms of getting their music out? And well, how did it land for you as a fan? Clearly, those things, they had an impact. Can you talk about that at all? Because I, I love that that part of the 70s. Me too. And I was a buyer of k -Tel Records and got those compilations like the Daredevils are on. They're on, I believe, six different titles. Mindbender. They <laughs> they get on board. I mean, you, you look at the sequencing and the Daredevils come on after the Rockford Files theme song by Mike Post and before Earth, Wind and Fire. And it's that kind of eclecticism that I love. And that's, that's the way radio was. You could get on pop charts with multi genres. Now it's more stratified. And I don't think that's for the good of the music necessarily. But at the time you could have 
so many different kinds of artists on a single album side. I love that. Hoyt Axton is on one of their compilation albums that they're they're on on KTEL. Amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, they, they were, as you know, performing the same kind of function at other platforms, whether it's Spotify or anybody else, will assemble playlists based on your choices. And, and these were good because KTEL was cheap and the sonic quality was not the highest, but you'd get maybe 10 songs on an album side. It was a great sampler. You always came away with somebody that you didn't know of that was your new favorite song. It's really incredible. Yeah. And the way that they were marketed, the garish colors, the hope springs eternal type of narrative voice in the TV commercials. It's great stuff. I, I sometimes go to YouTube and just listen to some KTEL commercials just to get transported back to the day because they are able to provide that Insta transport. And there's something about the artifact of a KTEL album that's just so redolent of the 70s. I mean, certainly if you pick one up, you will know what was in the musical cultural zeitgeist of the previous six to nine or 18 months. I mean, they are they are incredible artifacts for that purpose alone. Like this was what the shared culture was at that moment in time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there wasn't that big of a delta. That's the other thing. There wasn't that big of a delta in time between when the songs were hits and when KTEL got them out. It's really quite impressive that they were able to do it. <laughs> right. I'd like to know more about that element of the industry, how they hustled things into print based on the charts. And were able to get access to the great songs. I mean, I, obviously, later, a lot of it became the re-records, which, you know, you mentioned in the book infuriates fans of all artists. I guess it took the industry a minute to realize the the value of what they were sitting on. What else are you working on that 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 you would want to talk about or 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 do you want to talk about? I don't know if you if you curse your projects by saying them out loud, but what's next for you? Was there an exhale after turning this in and getting it done and now you're on to the next thing? Like what's in the world of Michael? I spent the decade of the 2010s on two projects, the Ozark Mountain Daredevils and Justin Hines. And I've got a much smaller book in mind for Justin Hines. I, I was thinking at first that I might do a biography. I mean, 10 years ago, I thought maybe I'll do a biography of Justin. And for a number of reasons, that's not tenable. But what I've got is a book titled Carry Go Bring Come, a little history of this ska, rock steady, and reggae classic. And I tell the story of that song, where it came from. And then I basically tell Justin's life with that as the core. And I'd like to do something with that. There's also a little period, 1966 to 68, when Greg Allman and Dwayne Allman, with their pre-Allman Brothers band, performed quite a bit in St. Louis. So I was thinking, uh, first of all, okay, this sounds like a scholarly monograph. I want that kind of focus, but I want a rhetoric that would be open to music readers of all kinds. I don't want a scholarly language to that, but I was thinking of focusing on Greg Allman, Dwayne Allman, and the St. Louis connection of these years 66 to 68. Was that Hourglass? Hourglass and the Allman Joys. So yeah, they go out to California, record these Hourglass albums, to, and it wasn't very satisfying for them on an artistic level or a financial level. But they, they'd come back to St. Louis. They lived for several periods. They didn't just barnstorm through St. Louis, but they'd have residencies in the old entertainment industry called Gaslight Square, which had a brief heyday. And then it lapsed into, well, there was crime and the kind of hollowing out of the, the city, the flight to the suburbs. Gaslight Square suffered as a result of that in the 1960s. So it would also be a, a story of that not just of these artists, but of white artists latching on to blues music, immersing in the culture, so that, you know, those two projects will be on my plate for the next foreseeable time. I would like both of them, please. So as soon as you can put <laughs> together pre-orders, I will uh, I will be putting my credit card down. Um, <laughs> You know, it's just to to talk about the 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 Greg and Dwayne thing for one second. It's really interesting because again, in the pre streaming area era, when when there was still that discovery of the dollar bin or what have you, 
those two Dwayne Allman anthology albums that came out where it collected all of his pre Allman brothers, all his session work. And there was some Allman joy stuff on there. Those records were like, those were touchstones, like having exhausted the Allman brothers catalog to go back and find all that other stuff that Dwayne did in an era where there wasn't really much information about it. Like I didn't know who King Curtis was, if not for Dwayne Allman, there was a lot of music that, that the classic rock world, sort of took me into because I didn't come from that background and I didn't understand the roots of some of this stuff. So yeah. And they were interesting guys. I mean, they were the, the way they just oozed music is it's incredible. Yeah. And the fact that they performed so much before the Alma brothers got together, they, they just, they were on the chitlin circuit for years. They honed their skills that way. When you listen to that debut album by the Almond Brothers Band, you wonder, where did they come from? This sounds like the work of a mature set of artists, but Greg Almond was 21 years old at the time. It's staggering to me. But the answer to that is, in part, all that club work that they were doing and residencies out of town for long periods of time, including St. Louis. Yeah, it puts them up there with people like the band or even somebody like Steve Winwood. Like these were people that they got on the road at a young age and just worked. And it, to your point, it shows in their studio albums. That first Allman Brothers album, it makes no sense as a debut album. It's so, it only makes sense knowing that they spent the previous, whatever, two to five years working it. I mean, it's such a powerful record. So well developed. It's unbelievable. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for spending time to do this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael Quelker. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On. We're presented by Osiris Media. Executive producers are Lawrence Purrier, RJB, Brian Brinkman, and Matt Dwyer. Producers are me, Lawrence Purrier, and Michael Donaldson. Our theme music is by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at SpotlightOnPodcast.com or at SpotlightOnPod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Osiris.